soon. Okay. When we left off last time, we were talking about combined business and personal pleasure. Was anyone not here last time and didn't get one of these things? video in YouTube. Okay, so we left off talking about combined business and personal pleasure. This whole chapter is about business deductions. So as a bit of a review, if you are self-employed or an independent contractor, where are your business deductions going to show up on the return? So if you own your own business. That's right. Schedule C. Exactly. So all those business expenses are going to be basically above the line deductions. Now if you're an employee, where are those business expenses going to show up? That is right, as an itemized deduction on Schedule A, subject to the 2% floor. So on your 1040 assignment, you do have some of that. You have one of your taxpayers is an employee and has some unreimbursed employment expenses and the other um, is a statutory employee which is um, discussed in the book and I discussed last time he will be able to use Schedule C for his business expenses. So, some things to think about. So let's talk about our, um, going back, we were talking about travel, travel expenses and remember there are different rules for domestic versus foreign travel. I don't know why we have different rules, but we do. And on the exam, you know, you will have a problem involving one or the other. So we talked about domestic travel and we left off. I think we had started to talk about foreign travel, but we didn't get there. So we're picking up with foreign travel. So the rule for foreign travel <coughs> is that your transportation expenses, that doesn't mean all of your travel expenses, but just your expenses on getting there, like your flight, your taxis, that kind of thing, your transportation expenses have to be allocated between business and personal days unless one of these three exceptions are, is met. Not all of them, just one has to be met. This is on slide 17. Either the trip is seven days or less, so we have seven days or less is the trip. Less than 25% of the time is for um, trip is seven days or less. And less than 25% of the time is used for personal purposes or the taxpayer has no control over the trip. So if one of these are met, then, um, did I do it wrong? Yes. Sorry. Less than 25% of the time is personal. So these are the rules here for um, a foreign trip. If you fall under one of these exceptions, you do not have to basically bifurcate transportation expenses. You still have to bifurcate all other travel expenses. So we're really just talking about transportation expenses here. So let's, the best way to see this is with an example. Let's look at example 24 in the book. In the current year, Robert takes a trip from New York to Japan primarily for business. He's away from home June 10th through June 19th. So June 10th through June 19th, which is 10 days. <clears throat> it says in the problem that 
three days are personal and seven days are spent business. Note that travel days are considered business days. So 10 days total, seven days business, three days personal. So, and let's see his expenses. He has transportation costs of $4,000. So we have $4,000 of transportation costs. He has um, lodging, which is $300 a day, and meals, which are $700 a day. $200 a day for meals. Okay. So let's first of all, the question is, okay, do we have to bifurcate between business and personal the $4,000 of transportation expenses? So let's look at the exceptions. Was the trip seven days or less? No, it was 10 days. Was less than 25% of the time for personal purposes? No. How much was personal here? 30%. So no, we don't have any facts to indicate whether he had control over the travel or not. Probably, we don't, we don't know. So assuming no, or assuming yes, he did have some control, then that means yes, we do have to bifurcate our transportation expenses. So out of $4,000 of transportation expenses, how much is he going to be able to take? Basically 70% of it, right? Because 70% of his trip was for business, 30% was for pleasure. So $4,000 times 70%, which equals $2,800. Yes, $2,800. I know I'm going backwards here, but we're still yelling away. Okay, 300 days of lodging. Now remember, we always have to bifurcate our travel expenses. Really, this test only applies to transportation expenses. So with our travel expenses, $300 a day is for lodging. How much of that is he going to get? 300 day, 300 day times seven days, right? Because seven days is for business. So 300 times seven is going to be $2,100. Now let's talk about his meals. Again, $200 a day times seven. But remember what we talked about last time, and we will talk about this here in a minute as well. Meals are subject to a 50% cutback. Meals for everybody, meals and entertainment, um, for all types of entities, for individuals. So that means only half of this $1,400 is going to be allowed as a deduction. So if we say divided by two, then that equals $700. Y'all see how that works? Okay. So his total deduction here is going to be 2800 plus 2100 plus 700. And that is example 24 in the book. So if we look at example 25, we're going to assume Robert is gone the same amount of time but spends two days rather than three vacation. So now he's vacationing for two days and he's there eight days for business. Still 10 days total. Now let's look at the test. Was the trip less than seven days? No. Was 25% of the time for personal purposes, less than 25%? Yes. Now it's 20%, right? Two out of 10 is 20%. So we do not have to buy for paid transportation expenses. So he's going to get to take the entire $4,000 as an, as an expense. With the lodging, it works the same, except he gets to multiply by eight, because now he has eight days that are business, which is $2,400. Same thing with the meals, times eight, which equals $1,600 divided by two, which equals 
$800. So his deduction is going to be these three things. So if he's self-employed, you will see this deduction on Schedule C. If he's an employee, you will see it on Schedule A as an itemized deduction, subject to the 2% floor. <laughs> but the actual calculation of it works the same. Whether you're self-employed or an employee, it's just going to show up differently on the return. Some things to note for this. Travel days are considered business days. Weekends, legal holidays, and intervening days are business days if both the preceding and succeeding days are business days. And if the trip is primarily for pleasure, you do not get any deduction of transportation expenses. You still get to bifurcate your other travel expenses, but no deduction for transportation. Slide with slide 18. Okay. Next topic to discuss is moving expenses. I'm going to adjust the camera a little bit. calculation of adjusted gross income. It does not matter whether the person is employed or an employee or self-employed. The moving expense deduction is the same um, and it is going to be on page one. So to be able to take a moving expense deduction It must be for a job, for a new job. So if you are traveling to be closer to family, to go to school somewhere, you do not get to take a moving expense deduction. You have to be traveling for a job. Now it can be a new job entirely with a new company, or maybe you're getting transferred to a different location within the same company. That's fine too, okay? There are two tests that have to be met to take a moving expense deduction. The distance test and the time test. So let's talk about the distance test first. The distance from the old home to the new job must be at least 50 miles farther than the old home to the old job. It is a funky little test. And we'll, I'll show you what it looks like in a second. One important thing to note, the location of the new home is not relevant for this test. Don't get confused. I've seen CPA exam questions, I've seen questions put out by Cengage where they throw in this fact of the distance to the new home. It's not relevant for this calculation. We only need the old home, the new job, and the old job. So let's look at a problem. So here's Gail's old house right here. This is her old residence. She lived 20 miles from her old job. Now she has a new job, and she lives 75 miles from her new job. You cannot just say, okay, well, she lives 75, she's now 75 miles away, so that's greater than 50, we're good. That's not how you calculate it. You have to say, basically, we're 75 miles from the old job to the new job, and 20 miles from the old house to the old job, so there is a 55 mile difference between the two. Since that is greater than 50 miles, 
the distance test is satisfied. So you have to take the distance between old job and new job and old job, I'm sorry, old house and new job and then old house and old job and then subtract those two differences. Do you see how it works? It is a strange little test. Um, I, this is how it works. And there is another example in the book on page 913. This is concept summary 9-2. Here we have a former residence and they live three miles from their old job and they have a new job that is 58 miles from their old house. So 58 miles minus 3 is 55 miles which is greater than 50 miles. So the test is met. Now for the second requirement. This is the um, this is the time test. The, um, the Congress does not expect that when you take a new job and you move to a new location that you are going to start working immediately. It takes some time. You have to figure out where your kids are going to go to school, where the grocery store is, you know, where the coffee shop is, all these things. So what they do is they give you a little bit of leeway. And they say, okay, you don't have to start work immediately, but you have to be working in 12 months after you move, you have to work for 39 weeks out of 52 in a year. So what they do is they give you a little bit of a gap to go and explore the area before you start work. So maybe you want to move there and then take a month long you know, vacation. That's okay. You can still take you know, your moving expense deduction. So long as you were a full-time employer employee for 39 weeks and 12 months following the move. If you are self-employed, we have a little bit of a different standard. If you're self-employed, you have to work for 78 weeks during the next two years following the move and 39 have to be in the first 12 months. So you basically have an additional requirement if you're self-employed. So, a note down there in the last bullet on the bottom, the test is weighed if you die, you're disabled, you're discharged, or you're transferred. So something you might be thinking about is, well, by the time the taxpayer files their return, they don't know if they've met this test or not. Unless you move in January, 12 months have not elapsed from when you move to when you have to file your tax return. So, or I guess it could be January, February, March, something like that. Often, taxpayers don't know if they have met the time test by the time they file their return. So what are the options? Well, the taxpayer has two options. They can either go ahead and take the deduction in the year that they move, even though the time test has not been met, or they can wait until the time test is met and take the deduction. So these, both of these options are acceptable under the code. They can choose the time frame for taking their deduction. And one thing I would like to draw your attention to, um, I should have done this a minute ago, but I didn't. If you look at the second page of the handouts that I gave you, um, it says 927. It says table one, deductible travel expenses. So especially a lot of you weren't here last time. These are all the things that are considered to be valid travel expenses. Um, you can see, look at some of the things on here. Cleaning, telephone, tips, meals, lodging, cars, baggage, and shipping. And you can see by meals, it says subject to 50% cutback. So you can take a look at some of the things that are considered to be deductible travel expenses.
The next question with moving is what is considered to be a qualified moving expense. So to be able to take a deduction, it has to be qualified. Most of the things that you would think about being qualified are qualified. So if you pay movers to come in and load your stuff for you and put it in a moving van, that's okay. Um, if you have to drive your car there, that's okay. You get paid 19 cents a mile. Um, if you have to stay in a hotel along the route, that's okay. That's a qualified expense. Something that is not qualified is meals. You cannot take a moving expense deduction for meals. And I said this in the last class. Honestly, this chapter is not very difficult. There are not a whole lot of calculations. But there are a good many concepts, and they all have their own little rules and their own little exceptions. So make sure you're organized for the final, you know what the rules are, what the exceptions, um, like for instance, for instance, for this one, meals are not deductible. Some other things that are, uh, are not qualified, uh, if you have to pay a real estate agent to sell your house, um, the commissions you have to pay, that's not a, a viable moving, a moving expense. Some other things that are not, if you have to, um, temporarily put your stuff in a storage building or live somewhere temporarily. That's also not a qualified moving expense. The things that are qualified moving expenses very much like getting you and getting your stuff from point A to point B, minus meals. That's very much what moving expenses are. If you have to put your stuff in storage temporarily, that's not, that doesn't count. Um, now, probably one of those pods does count. You know, if you put it in the pod and then you move the pod to your house, that probably would be fine. But if you're actually getting a storage building and storing it for a couple months, you know, while you live somewhere temporarily, those aren't considered to be qualified moving expenses. Um, so there are two, really two potential possibilities with how this is treated. For, um, for tax purposes, and it depends on if the moving expenses are reimbursed or non-reimbursed. So let's say you work for a big company and they pay your moving expenses for you. If they pay your moving expenses for you, do you think you get a deduction? No, you're not going to get double the benefit. But do you have to include it in income? No, I should don't. It's a wash. Okay, you don't have to include anything in income, but you also don't get a deduction. Now, let's say they only reimburse you for half of your moving expenses. Well, then you could take a deduction for the other half, okay, so long as they're qualified expenses. Now, uh, the more common scenario is you do not get reimbursed anything for moving. Most companies nowadays don't reimburse you for moving. Well, then you get an above-the-line deduction on page one of your return. It is not subject to any sort of monetary limits. So long as it's a qualified moving expense, you're good. Just think of it like this. You don't get double the benefits. If they're reimbursing you for it, then you're not going to get to take a deduction for whatever piece they're reimbursing. But you also don't have to include it in it. So if you remember, back to our big picture facts, we talked about Morgan. She had just graduated from college and she took her first job. She was really excited. Is she going to get to take a moving expense deduction? Yes, she is moving for her first job. So long as she is not reimbursed by her new employer, she will get to take a deduction for this because she is moving for work and she's moving like, I think it said she was moving a couple states over. So she's definitely going to meet the 50 mile test. Okay. Next topic. Education expenses. So, with education expenses, we are talking about education expenses associated with a business. So I'm not just talking about 
you graduate from high school and you go to SFA to get a college degree. That's not what I'm talking about. There are other provisions in the code that provide benefits in that situation. What we are talking about here is either you already have a job or um, really you either you're self-employed or you already have a job. So there has to already be a job in place. And you have to go to school for one purpose or another. These are the two basic situations that would allow you to take a deduction for education expenses. If you are going to maintain or improve your existing, keyword, existing skills. So let's say, and, and the, actually the code, or the regs have a lot of examples on this. So one example that they give is an accountant and they decide they're going to go to law school. Would they be able to take a deduction for that? Regs say no, because they are not improving their existing skills. They are basically creating new skills. The regs also give an example of a dentist who goes back to school to become an orthodontist. Is that improving his existing skills? The regs say yes. It's a fine line, I agree, and it is very subjective and there's a lot of case law out there. There's also a good bit of information in the regs, what's considered to be improving your existing skills versus starting a new skill. Another example that's given, um, we have an, an executive at a company and they decide to go back to school, they go to law school. Are they improving an existing skill or are they making a new one? Regs say they're making a new one. Does not deductible. But what if the executive goes to get an MBA? Well now the regs say that's enough of a fit to where we'll allow the deduction for that. It's high, it is a little bit, in, you know, squishy, I guess is the word I like to use. It's subjective. The other reason is if you are meeting the requirements of your employer or, of, or by law. So for example, when you all become CPAs, you, every year you will have to do continuing education requirements or CPEs. Would you think that would be something that would be deductible under these rules? Yes, because it's required by law and is probably required by your employer. And you're probably also improving your existing skills. But the big one is, it's required by law. So if you want to maintain your license, you have to go and get this continuing education. Um, when I worked at PwC, I was told that if I wanted to get promoted, I had to go back to school and take a couple classes at a junior college in financial accounting. So I did, begrudgingly. <laughs> And since I was told by my employer that I had to go, even though did it improve my existing skills? No, not really. I was a tax person. Financial accounting did nothing for me. Uh, and was it required by law? No. My employer told me I had to go, so I did, and um, so I could get promoted. Now please note, these deductions only apply if the employer is not paying for it. Same thing as moving expenses. Like the example I just gave with PwC, they actually paid for my classes. But if they had not paid, then I would have been able to take a deduction. So you don't get a double benefit. If your employer is paying for you to do this, then you don't get to take a deduction for it. For one thing, you're not actually paying for it. Your employer is. So they're going to get to take the deduction not you. So it does matter on if you're getting reimbursed or not. And again, if you're self-employed, this deduction will be on Schedule C. If you're an employee, it's going to be an itemized deduction on Schedule A. Some other things to note, 
Not deductible if you are going to get your minimal educational requirements. So, um, someone asked a question in the last class and they said, well, what if I get my bachelor's in accounting and I go out and I work a couple years and I come back to get my master's? Is that considered to be meeting minimal educational standards or would it be a deduction? And I said, well, it probably depends. So if you are only getting your master's so that you are eligible to sit for the CPA exam, then I would say, no, that's not a deduction. But if you're, why? Because that's the minimum standard. You have to have 150 hours to sit for the CPA exam. If it's a minimum educational standard, no deduction. But now if her employer said, if you want to keep working here, you have to go get a master's, then that's different. Because now that's a requirement for her job. So it depends, right? Is the employer saying you have to go? Or are you just going so that you're eligible to sit for the CPA exam? And if all you're doing is getting those minimal standards so you can sit for the exam, then that's not really going to be enough for a deduction. Again, please note, to be able to take this deduction, you have to already be employed somewhere. Okay? This is... Um, or be self -employed. So if you're going for a new trade or business, not deductible. Some of the expenses that are included, tuition, books, supplies, transportation, and travel. So the, the amount of expenses that are included here, um, quite a lot. Okay, They really let you include pretty much everything. And there are no monetary, monetary limits here. So... Whatever the expense is, that's the amount of the deduction that you get. Um, so, this is a different code section. This is code section 222, which I want to talk about. Honestly, I don't know really exactly why it's put here, because this code section has nothing to do with a business expense. Um, but I guess why they put it there is they say, okay, if you don't qualify the rigorous standards of a business deduction for educational purposes, there are still deductions out there that you can take for your tuition. This is under code section 222. Um, there are credits out there too for tuition, but we're not talking about credits right now, we're talking about deductions. So if you look on your 1040, there is a line on page one. It says, um, line 34, tuition and fees. So you can take an above the line deduction of your tuition and fees even if you're meeting minimal requirements, you're going to get a new business, a, a new trade. You basically, you don't meet the requirements of the last test. You can still take a deduction for your tuition, and it's an above the line deduction, so that's nice. It's above the line deduction for everybody, whether you're employed or self-employed, but there are some serious limits. This is the maximum amount of the deduction that you get. For single person, they can deduct $2,000. Looking at this chart, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me now that I'm looking at it. Because it says single married at the top, and then it says single in the middle, and then married at the bottom. I've never noticed that. I wonder if that's tight. Hold on. I'm going to have to take a look at that. So you're not tested on that. 
until I figure out why the chart is presented this way, which is um, strange. Does that make sense to anybody looking at it? Does it look like for a single MIG, main GI is 65, you get the 4,000, but if it's single and it's 65, put one, two, eight, and it's two, then married it's 130, you get four, but at the bottom it's 130 to 160 is too. Does that make sense? Is that right? That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I hadn't been looking at it that way. I just glanced at it, but I looked at it again, and I think the way you're thinking of it is correct. Although it is very strange how it is presented. Yes, you were right. So this is the threshold, kind of like two steps. This is the first threshold, and then if you're single and you're in excess of 65 to 80, then you get 2,000. Whereas if you're married and you're in excess of 130 up to 160, you get 2,000. And if you're single and you're in excess of 80, you get nothing. And if you're married and you're in excess of 160, you get nothing. That is right. That is a funky chart. With this deduction, you only get to take tuition and fees, basically. But no student activity fees, books, room and board, travel, etc. topic. It's related to entertainment and meals expenses. So I've already said that entertainment and entertainment and I've already really said meals. I haven't talked about entertainment. But meals and entertainment are both subject to a 50% cutback. This cutback is there for everybody. For corporations, partnerships, individuals, we all have this cutback. And it is for meals and entertainment. And the reason why we have the cutback is because of all the abuse possibilities. This was seen as a compromise in Congress because a lot of people said they should, people should, shouldn't get any deduction because of all the abuse. So this was a compromise and they said, okay, we're going to allow a 50% cutback for meals and entertainment. There are a couple exceptions. Um, where you do get to take the full 100%. Honestly, they're pretty minor. If they're at a subsidized eating facility or the de minimis fringe benefit is met, um, if it's some sort of like Christmas party, like a recreational activities, or if the full value of the meal is included in the employee's income. So, honestly, these are not all that common except for maybe the annual Christmas party or something. But the 50% cutback is pretty widely, widely spread. So let's talk about meals before we move on to entertainment. So with meals, some important things I want you to know. The meals are subject to the 50% cutback, but the transportation expenses are not. So I'm going to move the, the thing here. So, for example, Let's say I'll put transportation 100%. You pay $500 to take a client out to dinner, and then you pay $100 in cab fares. So the $500 is going to be subject to the 50% cutback, but the $100 that you spend to get there is not. Okay? So if you say, okay, this includes meals, tips, Parking at the restaurant, all that's going to be subject to the 50% limit, but the actual transportation is not subject to the limit, you know, the fees to get to the restaurant. 
or to get to the Rangers game if we're talking about entertainment. Some rules for meals and entertainment. The actual employee, or if you're self-employed, it would be you. The employee must be there. Must be present. And another rule is that business basically has to be discussed. It doesn't necessarily have to be discussed the whole time. You can only discuss it for five minutes of a two-hour meal, but it does have to be discussed. And meals are one of those things that have to be documented very precisely. So not only do you have to have the receipt, you have to write who was there, what employee was there, what business was discussed. You don't have to go into a whole lot of detail on what business was discussed because it's confidential may not want that to get in the wrong hands, but, you know, vaguely speaking. So you do have to keep excellent records to be able to take a deduction for meals and entertainment. So, and in fact, I have an example. Uh, my tax professor in, um, in law school, his wife was um, really high up at Deloitte. She was basically right at the level below partner. And they made her an offer to be partner, actually, and she turned it down, not for this reason another reason and um, she went they asked her to go to New Orleans to entertain some clients so she did and these clients apparently were some good old boys and they wanted to go to a strip club and she refused to go so she just gave them her company credit card and said you go do what you're gonna do I'm not going so she called her partners at Deloitte she was afraid that they were going to get upset with her because, well, now they can't take a deduction because she wasn't there. But they were just, you know, pleased that she wasn't going to sue them. So, you know, anyway. So let's look at a couple of examples. Joe pays a $40 cab fare to meet his client for dinner. So he has a $40 cab fare. Um, he had the meal cost $150 and he leaves a $30 tip. So these two, right, are going to be subject to the 50% cutback. So that's 180 divided by 2, which is $90. But the cab fare to get there is not. So we're going to have a total deduction of 90, um, 90 plus 40, which equals 130. Um, okay. With entertainment, uh, the entertainment can either be, the business can be done either at the event for the entertainment or can be done before or after the entertainment. Either one is acceptable. So here we're talking about taking your client out to, you know, an Astros game or something like that. Some things that are not considered to be deductible entertainment expenses, club dues. So if you have played for a yacht club, something like that, that is not considered to be deductible. But if you do go to a club and you pay for meals, then that would be. But the club dues themselves are not. Um, if you have tickets, this is on slide 39, if you have tickets that you buy um, in excess of face value, so let's say you go and buy them from a scalper, you only get to take a deduction for the amount that is face value. And there's luxury skybox, which a lot of companies have. Um, you basically only get to take the deduction of non-luxury seats. Um, you don't get to take the full deduction if you're paying for luxury seats. 
So if we look at an example, example 39 in the book, J Company pays $12,000 to rent a 10 seat luxury skybox for three games. During one of the games, there is one representative from J and eight clients. So we basically have nine people for one of the games. The average cost of non-luxury seats, it says $55 to $120 a seat. 55 to 120 average cost. So what is going to be the amount of their deduction? They let you take the higher end of the spectrum, so the 120 per seat. The question is, do you have to multiply that times 9, which is the amount of people that actually attended, or can you multiply it times 10, which are the seats that they actually purchased? Um, actually, they let you multiply it times 10, which is the amount of seats you actually purchased, so a taxpayer-friendly provision. So 120 per seat times 10 seats, even though there were only 9 people there, which equals a $1,200 deduction. Um, for that, um, they also it also says they had four hundred and ninety dollars for our food and beverages. So we have food of four hundred and ninety. So both of these items are going to be subject to the fifty percent cutback. So we have sixteen ninety divided by two, which means their deduction is going to be eight hundred and forty five dollars. along the same lines, business gifts. And you do have some business gifts in your 1040 assignment. We have business gifts which are limited to $25 per person per year. Some things don't count, they're just de minimis, like a pin and gift wrap. Also does not count in that $25. Okay. Next topic in this chapter is the home office deduction. So we're going to do a problem and then we're going to look at the forms. So again, this home office deduction, if you are self-employed or you're on your own business, you will see it on Schedule C, whereas if you are an employee, you will see it on Schedule A as an itemized deduction. I want to take a minute so this is a Schedule C. So if you look at the Schedule C, of course, you'll put all of your taxpayer information up here if they're on cash or accrual. Down here in Part 1 is where you're going to put their income from their business. And then Part 2 is where you put the expenses. This chapter has been all about the expenses. So if you look at some of the expenses, we have advertising, we have car and truck expenses. And a lot of your car and truck expenses, at least the ones related to mileage, are going to be also be right over here in part four. So don't forget about part four when you're working on your assignment. Um, let's see. You have some other things up here. We have interest, mortgage, legal and professional services office expenses, and then look over here, we have line 24, travel, meals, and entertainment. So first we have our travel, 24A, and then deductible meals and entertainment, 24B. So if we're looking at the amount that is deductible, what we want to make sure we put in here is the amount after the 50% cutback. 
And then we have our, a look down here, line 27 says other expenses. So if you have any sort of expenses that do not fit into any of these categories here, they're going to come from line 48. So let's go look down at line 48. Here's line 48. Here's where you list all of your other expenses. And you put your total down here at the bottom. This is where your cost of goods sold goes, if you have that. And then let's take a look at some of the information down here. Look at line 30. Expenses for business use of your home. So that's what we're about to talk about. Attached form 8829. There are two different methods for calculating the business use of your home. We have the um, regular method and then the simplified method. So we have regular versus simplified. And if you look down at line 30 of the 1040, the simplified method is right here. It's in old bold caps, so you choose either one or the other. Your regular method from form 8829 or your simplified method right here. And then, yeah. so let's go back to our slides. Dr. Zappa? Yeah. For our, like, project, which method are we supposed to use? So we'll talk about that in just a second, but you're going to use whichever one gives you the biggest deduction. So you'll have to run the numbers for both. So, and that's what any taxpayer would use, right? They're going to use whichever gives them the biggest number, the biggest deduction. So, to be able to take a home office deduction, it has to be exclusively and regularly used for the business. Now, this word exclusively, they, the IRS being they, take that very seriously. So if you have an office that's used in your home and it is used almost all the time for your off for your business, but then after school, a couple days a week, your kids go and do homework there. That's not exclusive. They're serious. They mean it has to be exclusively used for the business. There is a very minor exception for home daycares. I'll just mention that briefly. For the most part, it has to be exclusively. Yes. Is that just taken on faith, or is there a method of proving that? It's really just taken on faith. Okay. So, I've taken a home office deduction before, and I took pictures of it. I mean, I don't know how much that helps, but you can at least see, hey, all we have in here is a desk, a printer, a computer, a file cabinet. There are no toys in here that my kids can play with. There's no guest bed in here. I mean, it helps. So. Um, and as far as it being on, used on a regular basis, again, that's kind of a good faith thing. We have to assume honest taxpayers. Um, so to be able to take the deduction, it has to be the principal place of business or used by clients, patients, or customers. So the code was amended not all that long ago. Um, 1997 says it was amended and they basically allow the principal place of business to be expanded in certain circumstances basically I don't know if this is in the slide or not um, so if the taxpayer conducts administrative and management activities in the home and there's no other fixed place where the taxpayer can do these activities. And there's an example in the book, example 40, where we have a doctor, and he's an anesthesiologist. So obviously, he's going to perform his services at the hospital, not at his house. But that hospital does not give him any, an office to contact clients, to make appointments, to do administrative matters. So he has to do it at his home office. Does he see clients at his home office? No, he sees them at the hospital when he puts them under. 
but because this is where he does his administrative activities and there's no other fixed location to do it, he's allowed to take a business deduction. Now if, let me go back to the prior slide, if we have someone who is an employee versus an independent contractor, their home office must also be for the convenience of the employer. So we have an additional requirement if someone is an employee versus someone who is self-employed. This is on slide 41. So like I said, there are two methods. We have the regular versus the simplified method. Some other rules for the home office deduction. The home office deduction cannot create a loss. So what this means is we take our business income and then we subtract our business expenses except the home office deduction. Whatever is left is all of the amount of the deduction that you receive for home office. So your home office deduction cannot create a business loss. Just like we talked about with hobby loss, and rental income. There is a pecking order for deductions and a home office deduction. We start with our depreciation, I mean, our, not our depreciation, our interest and property taxes. Same thing as hobby loss and rental income. Next, we go to basically all else except depreciation. And then our third one is depreciation. Same pecking order. If you have anything left, it's going to carry forward. So if you were not able to take the full amount of your office expense deduction, which happens because an office expense deduction cannot create a loss, then that would carry forward into future years. So let's talk about the regular or the actual expense method first. This works very similar to the actual expense versus the standard mileage rate for um, car expenses, right? You can either take your actual expenses or you can use the mileage rate of 54 cents a mile in 2016 and calculate it times the business miles used. So this is exactly the same. We can either go through and calculate our real expenses and use the regular method, or we can use the simplified method, which does not involve any expenses. You don't have to track expenses, which is why the simplified method was created. And by the way, it was not created all that long ago. I think it was created four years ago, the simplified method. And the big reason why it was made is because taxpayers can't keep up with their receipts. So let's look at the regular method first. So with the regular method, we have two categories for expenses. We have our direct expenses and we have our indirect expenses. So your direct expenses are expenses that only affect your home office. So for example, you paint your home office, you get new furniture in the home office. Those are things that only affect your home office. Your indirect expenses affect the whole house. So these are things like your property taxes on your house, your mortgage interest, your utilities that you pay. These are things that affect the whole house. And when we're looking at our indirect expenses, we have to multiply times the amount 
a home office percentage. So let's look at an example. Example 43 in the book. We have Rick, who's a CPA. He's employed by a regional CPA firm as a manager. He also operates a separate business in which he finishes furniture in his home. For his business, he uses two rooms in the basement of his home exclusively and regularly. It tells us exclusively and regularly, so we do not have to go through and analyze that. The floor space of the two rooms is 240 square feet. So we have 240 square feet. And there are 2,400 total square feet in his house. So what is the percentage allocated to his home office? 10%, right? So I'll put 10% above indirect expenses. So he has gross income from the business of $8,000. So he has $8,000 of business income, and he has $6,500 of business expenses with the exception of the home office deduction. So basically that leaves him $1,500 left to allocate to a home office deduction. So let's first go through the regular method here. Okay, so he has a direct expense of, or he has, I'm sorry, he has real property taxes of $4,000. Is that indirect or is that direct? Indirect, but that is right. So we're going to take $4,000 times 10%, right? So that's a deduction of $400. He has interest, he has interest on the residence, mortgage interest, of $7,500 times 10%, right? Which equals $750. He has operating expenses, so I'll just say, um, I'll just say utilities, okay? On the house of $2,000. And he gets to take 10% of that, which equals $200. And he has depreciation, which has already been calculated for the 10%, um, which is $350. So now we have to look at these numbers right here. This is problem 43. And determine which one of these is going or is he going to be able to take? Which one? So we start first with our first category, interest and taxes, which is a total of um, $1,150. So out of this $1,150, not an issue, he's going to be able to take all of it. $1,150, because he has $1,500 to play with, basically. Then he has an extra $200 here, so now that takes us to $1,350, right? So how much of the depreciation is he going to be able to take? That is right, $150. Why? That's right. Can't create a loss. $1,500, which is what we have left, minus $1,350, which is this and this combined. So that leaves $150 left to play with. So that means he is going to basically have $200 of depreciation to carry forward to use later. And his income from the business is going to be $0. Now what about with gifts? On our problem, they have like the expenses listed for the home office, but that doesn't include the taxes or interest, but that's like on the other page. Mm -hmm. So do we just like add that in there even though it's not yeah. listed? Yeah, because it's a home office deduction and um, it's 
deduction. And then you have to like subtract that out of your itemized deduction, so right? That's exactly right. Okay. So if you are using 10% of your taxes and interest towards your home office deduction, how much are you going to have as an itemized deduction? 90%. Do not put 100% as an itemized deduction on Schedule A because now you are counting the 110%, basically. You're double counting it. So that's right. If a taxpayer itemizes, then the rest of it, that 90%, will be an itemized deduction. Now, this taxpayer did not have any direct expenses. But if they did have direct expenses, then they would not be subject to this 10% limit. They would get the direct expense at 100% because it's all related to the home office. Now, let's talk about the simplified method real fast. Again, with the home office, if you are self-employed or on your own business, it will be on Schedule C. If you're an employee, it will be an itemized deduction. With the simplified method, it is just that. It is simple. It is $5 per square feet um, up to a maximum of 300 square feet. Since he's using $240, $5 times $240 equals $1,200. He's going to choose the greater of the two, which, of course, will be this one, which is $1,500, with the $200 carry forward. So, we have a couple minutes left. In that time, I want to take a look at a form for the home office deduction. Form here. Okay, so if we're looking at this form here, Form 8829, you can see here that it asks up here in Part 1, what's the area of your house that you are regularly using for business? Now, what's the total area of your house? In question two, what's the percentage? Then we're going to take that percentage and we're going to multiply it by whatever is an indirect expense in column B, right? Because that's going to be the amount that you get to use. But you don't multiply that percentage times your direct expenses in column A. Um, also take a look at this line eight in part two. Line 8. So line 8, basically what we're doing with line 8 is it says take your business income from Schedule C and subtract out any other trade or business expense except business use of your home. So that's what we're doing with line 8 is we're getting to this $1,500 number, okay, to see what amount we can offset against, basically. And then we have our deductions right here related to use of the home. Um, and you can see up here at the top, we have our mortgage interest, we have our real estate taxes, and then we'll have other things, insurance, rents, repairs, and utilities. You might be thinking, well, where is depreciation? Okay, well, depreciation is down here at the bottom, depreciation of your home, okay? We have a um, basically a separate section for that. So, um, and you might, you will probably have to go take a look at the instructions to figure out what percentage you need to use for your depreciation. Because they are not going to just give you the number like they did in this problem. Although on your exam, <coughs> you will just be given the number. You don't need to bring your depreciation schedules to the final. It. See how we have direct and indirect expenses? So I will see y'all next week. We don't have much left in chapter nine. Ten minutes maybe. And then we'll start chapter ten.